Coming up, is T-Bone Stadium on the brink of foreclosure? Why Wyandotte County's unified government is now spending millions of dollars to buy the ballpark. Groundbreaking for the new Kansas City Crime Lab and East Patrol Police Building. But even before construction begins, why is the project already close to $20 million in the hole? Also this week, why are some Missouri lawmakers trying to impeach Governor Jay Nixon? Plus, digging into school spending in Kansas. And after dumping more than $3.5 million into the former King Louis Bowling Alley in Overland Park, once touted as the future home of a National Museum of Suburbia, why are Johnson County leaders now bringing the entire project to a screeching halt? Hello everyone, I'm Nick Haynes and we're delighted to have you with us again on the program that goes beyond the soundbite and takes you behind the headlines, making news in Kansas City, dissecting those stories this week in a pithy, engaging and insightful way from 41 Action News investigative reporter Ryan Kath. From the editorial pages of the Kansas City Star, Barbara Shelley, star political reporter, blogger and columnist Dave Helling, and KCTV5 chief investigative reporter Stacey Cameron. Home run or strike out, the unified government of Wyandotte County announcing this week they're getting ready to buy Community America Ballpark, the home of the T-Bones, in an $8 million deal. The move is surprising enough, but as Ryan Kath from 41 Action News uncovered this week, the unified government has been secretly bailing out the T-Bones for some time. When the owners of the T-Bones brought the team to Kansas City a decade ago, they financed Community America Ballpark with private dollars. Despite growing attendance numbers, team president Adam Ellert told me the economic model is now striking out. Privately funded stadiums simply do not sustain themselves. So the unified government is stepping up to the plate with an offer to buy the ballpark with sales tax revenue. But the 41 Action News investigators discovered your money was already spent in secret months ago. In January, County Administrator Dennis Hayes made the decision to pay $174,000 to the ball team to help them pay the mortgage. 41 Action News learned elected leaders didn't hear about the taxpayer deal until a closed-door executive session this summer. Why not tell them earlier? I don't know that I can answer that. But UG uh, spokesman Mike I Taylor can't. told us it was a completely legal business maneuver to keep the team from folding in Kansas City. That's going to be pretty surprising for people to hear. They were about to be foreclosed on. Right. The, the stadium, right, the stadium would have been foreclosed on uh, because of... of the difficulty in making the bank payments for the construction of the stadium. So what would happen then if the unified government didn't step in on Community America Ballpark? Well, it depends who you ask. We asked the T-Bones owner about an hour after that interview that you just saw an excerpt of, and they said normal business negotiations were going on the whole time. They were in no financial difficulty whatsoever. The next day, we obtained a copy of that secret agreement from earlier this year in January, and there were a number of indications there were some serious financial issues that the T-Bones owners were facing. The UG wanted an assurance from the bank that the bank was not going to take any adverse action during the process of negotiations. There was also the revelation that the T-Bones owners were about $283,000 uh, behind in delinquent property taxes. Any hint whatsoever from the editorial pages there of the Kansas City Star, Barbara Shelley, that there was any trouble whatsoever there at Community of America Ballpark? Well, this is the first um, I've heard of it, but it hasn't really been on my screen before now. I will say about this, I find it extremely unusual that um, in a government, the size of the unified government, the executive has that kind of discretion to turn over a payment of $87,000. I mean, most cities, school boards, whatever, would have some kind of um, policy on how much an executive can spend without going to the commission for approval. Well, and, and a lot of municipalities do. You see it in, in the city of Kansas City, Missouri, where the city manager can, and I believe it's only twenty or $25,000 that he can make decisions. To see that kind of money move that quickly and without the greater part of the commission uh, in the county having heads up it, it is worrisome. What's interesting, I think, about this is having worked in minor league baseball for a year, I know we leased the stadium, uh, and the lease itself was the largest expense that the ball club have. We were profitable other than that, and we didn't have the attendance near what the T-Bones have. So I'm not surprised to see that ownership of that ballpark was possibly going to bankrupt that team because that is a horrible business model, and it may in the end up being a great investment for the county to come in and buy this thing for $8 million, but the problem 
problem is, like Ryan pointed out, there was no transparency in these transactions. And it was going to be something that was almost after the fact where millions of dollars were going to exchange hands because hundreds of thousands clearly already had. But it seems unclear to many members of the public, though, that it seemed such a, a successful uh, ball club, that the attendance had been so great, Ryan, that why would this even need to be necessary? Well, and that was what we kept hearing earlier this week, was that the team itself is doing really well. They, they draw well. They have, they have great attendance. Um, you'd have to get into the finances of how everything went down back in 2003 when the stadium was built, how much they put on the line for the mortgage. And I think just earlier to the point we were talking about, County Administrator Dennis Hayes has been around a long time. He's given a lot of latitude with his decisions, and that's apparent with this move right here. Um, but it is worth noting, he did ask for an extensive legal review before going into that secret agreement to make sure that it did follow county policy. The unified government now, though, looking at purchasing the ballpark, uh, Dave Helling, and, and the unified government saying that them purchasing this is no different than what's happening in the Truman Sports Complex, where that is the county, Jackson County, owns the Truman Sports Complex, and that both teams, the Royals and the Chiefs, uh, just lease those facilities well, from the county. Uh, is there any difference? Well, of course, the county built the stadiums out of the Truman Sports Complex. Originally, they didn't buy them from anybody. This was a private transaction that, in essence, the taxpayer uh, is going to bail the uh, team out on. Um, but, and, but it does raise an extraordinarily important question going forward, Nick, and that is, once the county or the unified government buys this facility, who will be responsible for ongoing maintenance and improvements and rebuilding the structure? Uh, that is really where the expense comes in terms of what taxpayers may have to shell out, as we have learned, by the way, out at the Truman Sports Complex. And I did have a chance to exchange some emails with Mike Taylor to get a clearer understanding on that. And apparently, it is still under some negotiation in terms of what the team will be responsible for for ongoing maintenance, what the county might be responsible for. He did say that of the $8 million purchase price, Two and a half million would be used for maintenance. Five and a half would be the actual cost, at least based on the email I got. So that's what we really have to pay attention to. What are taxpayers on the hook for going forward in terms of subsidizing repa uh, repairs, improvements, and other maintenance out at that stadium? Well, and I, I can tell you, uh, having been the legal counsel for our ball club back in West Virginia, major maintenance and improvement was on the city that owned the the facility. We as the ball club had to take care of things that were on the field like the turf and things of that nature but when you come to major things like if the concrete of the foundation started to crack, if the water mains underneath the stadium were to fell, those ended up being on the city in this instance probably the county. The other thing we're going to have to look at is how much would the T-Bones pay in rent going forward? Is it going to be enough to make the facility itself profitable for the county. I really doubt it. I think where the county is going to try to say that this is profitable is keeping the team in there so the team pays payroll taxes and has employment that helps support the surrounding business. But I would be very surprised if this county uh, doesn't go in the red in the long term in purchasing the stadium. I was just going to say I'm always surprised every week at all the stuff <laughs> Stacy's done before he's gotten here. <laughs> uh, uh, right. What, what has been the response to that story since you, when you, certainly the secret payments that were coming from uh, Wyandotte County, what was the response to that story? You know, some folks from within the UG kind of bristled at that description of, you know, some people were calling this a secret bailout, secret subsidies. Uh, some of the community response I received was that thank you for covering this. You know, there are some folks over there who feel like there's a news vacuum in Wyandotte County and it just doesn't get the same coverage as you know Kansas City Missouri and some of the other places around the metro area we looked at this as two different stories there's there's the long-term story of the ballpark and keeping the T-bones in town for 20 years the other story was the transparency issue you have to take into account that commissioners did not find out about these secret payments until months later and that's when this was put on their laps and said hey we can go forward with this but by the way We've already spent $157,000. Kansas City officials put shovels in the ground this week on the new crime lab on East Side Police Patrol Building. Houses in four blocks from 26th Street and Prospect Avenue to Brooklyn Avenue were demolished to make room for the new police campus. But as the dirt was shoveled as part of the groundbreaking ceremony, the project is already coming close to $20 million over budget. How is that even possible? Dave Helling? 
Well, partly because there have been design changes, partly because the police department is notorious for underestimating costs, and partly because the acquisition of property over there turned out to be a bit more expensive than people thought. You put all of that together, and there have had to, been, uh, had to be some changes in terms of the design to shrink it, to make it more palatable uh, for the budget. Remember, for all the opposition, Nick, to, to the construction of this property, there were people when it was proposed who thought it would be a good thing for that neighborhood, that it would provide a community center, that it would, in essence, provide city and taxpayer investment in a very, very poor part of the community. There is not, some people don't like it, some people still do, however, it is not all, you know, the entire neighborhood is not against this project going forward. Ryan. This summer, we had requested a list of all the purchase prices of those properties within that four square block area. And it came down to about a $3.5 million acquisition cost. So we called up City Hall and said, well, how does this compare to the original estimate? And the response was, well, there is no original estimate. That $57 million estimate you heard about didn't have that kind of line by line breakdown. So you, it almost made it sound like that $57 million was written on the back of a napkin, and that was about as accurate as it got. And then it wasn't until later in the process where they said, well, there are some other design aspects we need to take into account, other amenities. And one of the other things they did was they compared to the Johnson County Crime Lab for their estimate, but that was built on vacant property. Why did this have to be built on the homes of where, where people were living anyway, Barbara Shelley? Given the amount of space there is in East Kansas City, so many vacant homes and vacant lots, did it need to be in a place where there were homes already where people were living? Well, I think for the size of the campus they're talking about, you would have gotten involved in some, you know, home demolition uh, as it was. You're right, there are a ton of vacant lots. and. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they chose that particular location, you know, except that it, it is an, an area that the police <laughs> feel would be a good place for them to be. Um, you know, one thing that's very few people have contested during this process is that Kansas City really needs a good state-of-the-art crime lab. That would be great to have a backlog now. And, you know, one of the really unfortunate aspects of um, the bungling that's gone on in this whole saga is that now they're talking about scaling back on, on the size and, and what, what they want to do with that crime lab. And, and that, I think that's very unfortunate. But this was part of a yeah. 2010 public safety sales tax campaign. So there were voter commitments made as yeah. a result of this. So are, are some of those campaign promises now being broken as a result of this? Well, absolutely they are, Nick. You're talking about a project now that's coming in somewhere at least about $20 million over budget, and it's not complete yet. And you look at this, I'll answer your previous question, no, it didn't have to be built where it was. The city owns tons of properties that it could have looked at to either partially use and then maybe expand out if it needed to. So the acquisition costs could have been more. And a lot of this is overrun in things like soft costs, where we're talking about furniture and equipment, we're talking about design, we're talking about, what is this, uh, $8.5 million in consulting fees. We are talking about a bunch of things that the city mismanaged or knew were possibly going to be over, and nobody at the time held their feet to the fire. And Mayor Sly James has said going forward with this, look, 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 we're not going to talk about this. We're not going to bring this up. It's done. Needle and damage done. And that isn't the way the city should do business. So now taxpayers are on the hook, $20 million more, in a crime lab that's going to be smaller than what was promised. And this is unacceptable, especially when we start to look at big capital projects that we've talked about before, the KCI airport and the light rail in downtown. The city doesn't know how to spend money or come in under well, budget the, the, for yeah, anything. I mean, the police training facility north of the river also was yeah. extraordinarily yeah. Over, budget. over budget. I mean, the police department does have a particular problem with design. But, but we should also just point out for discussion that when this site was picked, there was support for it because that you know that part of the city is extraordinarily challenged and the idea was to finally spend some taxpayer money in a part of the community that needed help now Stacy's right, right, you know, it may have been mishandled. It, there may have been alternatives that would have been cheaper or better for taxpayers, but, the, but at least the initial idea was this is an area that could use something like this. Now there are some discussion that but, maybe but, that okay. was over. Ryan. Wrong. And, and on Dave's point there, uh, there are sentiments out there that the only reason we're hearing so much about these cost overruns are because of the location. It's an east side project, so now everyone cares about these cost overruns. If it was in the Northland, we wouldn't hear nearly as much about the cost overruns, but the difference here 
is the cost overrun, you know, we became aware of before those shovels even hit dirt. And that's what makes this, I mean, just kind of stunning. I think we talked about the cost overruns in the Northland, too. A lot. But, but what is it fair? Yeah. This isn't economic okay. development on these side. This is civic development. And I don't think it nearly helps these side is what people want to try to argue. That okay, we do have other topics to deal with on this Week in Review. While several Kansas school districts are suing the state for an additional $400 million in funding, accusing lawmakers of shortchanging students, KCTV 5's Stacey Cameron has been examining how the $7 billion already allocated for education is being spent in some surprising ways. When it comes to public schools in Kansas, Dave Trabert says some things don't add up. It's mind-boggling, frankly. But he's not talking elementary math. He's talking about the salaries paid to some non-teaching staff. There's school districts where custodians make more than teachers. Trabert is president of the Kansas Policy Institute, an economic and political think tank. He points out one of those districts is Kansas City, Kansas, where last year 91 custodians got paid more than $50,000. Two made more than 60 grand, and one swept up a salary of $76,000. That's double what some of their teachers make. Janitors aren't the only ones cleaning up in KCK schools. Some painters, plumbers, electricians, and carpenters make more than 70 grand a year. When maintenance needs to be done, it has to be done. But what's the most effective way to get it done? Is this an employment system for adults or is it an education system for children? That's freshman Senator Jeff Melcher. He thinks the most efficient way might be to eliminate some staff and hire out those jobs. They will be able to do as effectively or better for dramatically less money. All right, do most school districts, by the way, this is an excerpt from a much larger report that you did this week on KCDV5, but do most school districts, by the way, have these uh, plumbers and um, also locksmiths that were also part of the bigger report in their school districts full-time, uh, Stacey Cameron? Absolutely. You'll see other things like a... HVAC technicians, you'll see architects, you see the locksmiths, you see carpenters, you see painters. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong with these people making a living wage. This report isn't to point out that these people are making too much money. It's to ask whether they're getting taxpayer money and whether the school districts could do it more efficiently. Because look, we live in an environment right now with a very right-wing Kansas legislature that if they had their choice, they would cut funding. And so Jim Henson, the new superintendent at Shawnee Mission says, I have to look and assume that my budget isn't going to move and it's probably going to be cut. I have to start looking at efficient ways to bring costs down. And the first thing to do is possibly look at the people that we have on staff. Are they doing enough work to justify their salary, probably 90% of them may be. But if there's a way to cut these costs, if it's outsourcing or, or eliminating positions, we have to do it. Administrator pay is another thing that they're going to have to look at. Shawnee Mission themselves has multiple assistant superintendents making over six figures. They have to look at things like that. Public information officers making upwards of six figures. So there's a lot of spending that goes outside of the classroom, outside of the classroom, not technology in the classroom or teachers, that these schools have to look at and how they allocate that money. But one of the arguments also would be here, would they really save that much more money, Barbara Shelley, uh, by outsourcing uh, all of these uh, tradesmen in these, or tradeswomen in these school districts um, than having yeah. them on staff? You know, in a way, I, I think um, Kansas Policy Institute is throwing out some red herrings here. Um, I mean, it's a good story and everything, but, you know, if you take 10 janitors and cut their salary in half and maybe you save $30,000 a year, that's not going to help. Uh, that's not even going to hire a teacher. You're not talking ten janitors, though. You've got you've got you've got 91 janitors combined making five million dollars a year. That's from their own salary figures. That is a big chunk of money. And no one's saying that 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 money is being spent unwisely. It's saying, look at it. Study it. The schools don't even want to do that. Anyone asking for more money in Kansas, if you say that schools just need to look at their efficiency, they think someone like me hates education and kids. That's not the point. Can we do business better? No one, especially me, wants to see teacher salary cuts. They need to, teachers need to pay higher 
in Kansas. Mm -hmm. we, need, we need better ratios of student to teachers in Kansas. We need more money to allocate to curriculum and technology in the classroom, and the schools have to figure out a way to do it, and it may be cutting some of these jobs, unfortunately. But I actually wonder if this situation in Kansas City, Kansas, might not be an outlier, because frankly, you know, Kansas school, um, public schools have been cut in their budgets for years, and that alone will foster efficiency. But this is also a state, by the way, that has so many different school districts, 286 yes. school that districts, 31 of them with fewer than 200 students in their entire school districts. We also have five school districts in Kansas with fewer than 100 yeah, uh, the, students, the, the, and yet we don't do anything about consolidation of school districts right. in Dave Kansas, Traber, which could save huge amounts Dave of Traber money. Dave Traber could talk about that a little bit more, and that is consolidation of school districts. Last year we went down to Sumner County to do a story uh, on federal spending. It's a rural county south of Wichita. They have eight school districts, not eight schools, eight districts for 3,000 students in that, uh, in that community or that county. Consolidation is the way to save serious money in the state of Kansas. That's how you would get at duplication of administrators and that type of thing. And that's where the real money will have to be saved eventually in Kansas. But let's be careful with consolidation because that scares me. When you consolidate, it allows them after three years to cut student base eight. And I don't want to see that happen. So we've, if there's going to be consolidation, there has to be some type of legislation put in there that doesn't allow lawmakers to cut that student base eight. It can't happen. Back to the salaries that, that Stacy was talking about, you know, he, he focused um, towards the end of his piece on KCK and talking about why some of their custodial salaries were so high. And I think the answer you got was something to the effect of they have older buildings and there are more specialties needed and people that can work on things that have gone extinct in the maintenance world. Um, just on the other side of the state line, I do believe that Kansas City, Missouri has started outsourcing some of the custodial work. I would just be curious to see what some of those cost savings are, what some of the results are. Yeah, and you see Shawnee Mission is actually going okay. to look at this. They're going to examine whether or not outsourcing will be the answer in that district. Okay, we move on on this week in review. A Missouri state lawmaker wants Governor Jay Nixon impeached for violating the constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriages in the Show Me State. Republican freshman representative Nick Marshall of Parkville says he's approached GOP leadership about articles of impeachment proceedings but he claims this is not a gay rights issue. He says Nixon's order last week permitting same-sex couples married in other states to file joint returns on Missouri tax forms violates the 2004 constitutional amendment. But why does Marshall believe the governor's actions violate the Missouri Constitution, Barbara? Well, because Missouri voters... Um in, what, what was that year? Um, in the mid-2000s. Yeah, in the mid-2000s. I think it was 2004. We passed a constitutional amendment um, banning gay marriage. And Nick Marshall is contending that Governor Nixon's recent order violates that constitutional amendment. And does this have any chance of happening? Oh, no. Dave, the impeachment? Yes. Yeah. No. In fact, I talked to Nick Marshall a couple of days ago, and uh, he says he wants to pursue it. But you don't sense a groundswell from Republicans in the legislature to, uh, uh, you know, approach this or to accelerate any effort to impeach the governor, although my guess is there will be legislative attempts to overturn his decision on tax filing. We'll probably see those come up sometime later. Um, but, but, but I do think that there, you know, Jay Nixon, let's be clear, has pushed the envelope of the executive authority, as most governors try to do. You know, he got crossways a little bit with the legislature by diverting money for the Joplin tornado recovery effort from other state spending. Now this step, which at least some people think exceeds his authority, I, I do think there will be a broad look at ways that the legislature might try to limit what the governor can do next year. Now, there was an Associated Press analysis piece saying the governor is moving, shifting left, because this is about an effort to look at a potential national office for himself, a possible vice presidential nod, a cabinet spot. Do you see that happening? Well, I think the cabinet spot may be possible. A vice presidency, I, I don't think is, but you see about him moving left. Look, he wanted to expand Medicaid here in the state. He vetoed very popular, at least a legislative popular uh, tax cuts, and now this move with gay marriage. Yes, he's positioned himself from who might have been a one time a very moderate Republican much further to the left, and, and he hasn't said what his intentions are in 2016 other than we know he's not going to be in the governor's mansion anymore. I think this is to become a national player. And finally this week, after spending more than three and a half million dollars to buy and stabilize the former King Louis Bowling Alley at 88th and Metcalf in Overland Park, which at one time, by the way, was touted as the home 
home for a new National Museum of Suburbia. The project has come to a screeching halt. Johnson County leaders just voted against issuing $10 million in bonds to remodel the facility, which was also to be the new home of the Johnson County Museum. Why the change of heart? Well, in the current environment, a, a, a museum for suburbia is not probably on the high on the list of most taxpayers, particularly in Johnson County. And I think lawmakers just said, let's back away while we still Is this anything to do with the fact there's also a leadership race going on in Johnson County uh, right now, where you have Ed Eilert and Ed Peterson looking for a Johnson County Commission chair uh, opportunity there, going against each other? Quite possibly, to Dave's point, I would almost wonder if in any environment is the Museum of Suburbia something Well, they have one. I mean, there is a, there are some uh, efforts in Johnson County and other places. And of course, Kansas City has a jazz museum, a Negro Leagues museum, a Kansas City museum, a World War I museum. So museums do have some attractiveness. It was just in the current environment, I think. It's a lot of money. I, let me just throw in, I used to bowl there, so I, I'd love to go back. Stacy, <laughs> well, you needed more than $10 million uh, for renovations and so I don't think that bond issue would have played favorably in anybody running for office in Johnson County so I think that 10 million dollar price tag going forward is probably what killed Alrighty, us. and that is our week in review. Uh, thanks to our news reviewers from KCTV5 chief investigative reporter Stacy Cameron and from the editorial board of the Kansas City Star Barbara Shelley, the Star's political reporter Dave Helling and from the investigation unit at 41 Action News Ryan Kapp. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.